I'm very excited to be here today at this symposium to talk a little bit about uh, how I spent about a year and a half of my time at the wharf uh, with Clark Construction. And so we're here to talk about the District Wharf at the Southwest Waterfront in Washington, D.C. Just very quickly, a little bit about myself. John hit a few of the highlights, but I've been with Clark for 12 years. I've been in the industry for 14, having worked in the architecture profession for part of my time during undergraduate and my graduate degrees at UVA. Um, my interest back even when I was in school was at the urban scale, looking at infrastructure systems and how that informed development, uh, both in the traditional vertical built environment, but also in landscape design. And um, so I was involved in the pursuit of the Silver Line, very proud to have worked on that for two years leading up to that award. And um, currently right now, I run one of our eight mid-Atlantic business units uh, for Clark Construction here and uh, have a variety of active projects. But I'm here today to talk to you about my role as the design executive on the wharf. Um, and so in that design build project, I had a counterpart who ran the, the building portion of it and I led the design portion of the design build. So I could speak for hours about the project. It's a project and a team that was very near and is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I'm going to hit on a few highlights. And the three highlights that I want to talk about today are some of the nuances of the very unique pr project that it is. I also want to talk about the formation of the best team to make sure that we had the right cast of characters uh, to execute this very aggressive project within a very aggressive timeline. And then also the mechanics of leading that team through the first year and a half of design. So this is the vision of the District Wharf um, that we are now building into reality. Ultimately, this is what um, the Anacostia Waterfront uh, Initiative and then also Hoffman Madison Waterfront in partnership with the District of Columbia uh, had envisioned. It's been a project that's been in gestation for well over a decade and this is what we are actively building now. Uh, the project is divided into two phases, one and two, and all combined, it's 3.1 uh, million square feet of mixed-use development. This is the largest private um, PUD in the history of DC for the Zoning Commission, and it was a two-stage PUD. Stage one was accomplished in 2011, and then there was a two-part step to the stage two PUD, and that was achieved, accomplished, approved in uh, 2012. So just to give you a geographic orientation to where we are in space, uh, this is the lower peninsula, as I like to call it, of the District of Columbia. Uh, it's the wharf site is located right along the Washington Channel there. I've highlighted it there in red for you to see. Borders the southwestern edge of DC, right across from Haines Point. It's important to understand uh, the complexities of the site and the history of the site because it's very layered history and it started to inform some of the visioning and how the design came to be and sensitivities that we had to pay attention to during the development of the design and also the construction. So originally this area was formed by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1800s to respond to flood concerns and to make it essentially a mercantile waterfront and activate the waterfront. They dredged soil um, from the Washington Channel to create this and so at the time the scale of the fabric in this area was a very small scale neighborhood, very granular. Um, actually, I want to go back for a second. This left image is uh, looking southeast across the, um, across the site in about the 1910s, and this image on the upper right is looking northwest right around 1931. So you can see the size and the scale and how this was starting to take shape. Um, here is another image uh, looking southeast about late 1885 and you can start to see the small grain of it and the ships and how this is all starting to take on a very small scale feel. Uh, it was at the time a very active waterfront. And then came the 50s and 60s and also the uh, construction of 395 which essentially carved a significant scar through the urban fabric. And in doing so, it displaced a significant number of residents and businesses. And this was something that um, was at the forefront of the vision and the planning when this project was initially conceived. So here are some images of some of the active, open uh, retailers, shall we say, that are still open for business today. Captain White, Jesse Seafood, and right from our quarter one 2014 groundbreaking, open today to the public, and also, I might add, many construction workers. This fish market is open and we still frequent it. Um, and so we're happy that we've been able to work with our neighbors to help keep their businesses open while we had a pretty massive intervention, shall we say, right next to their site. Um, 
this, this was a really important thing for Hoffman Madison Waterfront to be able to preserve this. It's a real part of the wharf, and they wanted to preserve and sustain the culture. And it, you know, interestingly, is uh, you know, it's of significance because it's the longest continually operating fish market in the country in one form or another. If you think of it in the likes of, for example, Fulton Market in New York. So um, when we started in April 2014, this is what the Southwest Waterfront District Wharf looked like. There were about 100 boats uh, in a variety of uh, floating docks that were located there. Um, it was essentially dead by day. Yes, there were restaurants. Yes, there were nightclubs. But if you look at the image on the right, this was taken at about 10 o'clock in the morning. It was not an active waterfront. It really, the only people that were using it were the people who were the residents on the boat. So th this, this is the case for why it was a prime opportunity for development. So a little bit later, I'm going to talk about the timeline of the project. But I, I, I do need to make the point that it is literally no exaggeration that it took an act of Congress to get this project to where it was. In fact, not just one, but it took four. The fourth of which uh, President Obama himself uh, actually signed. So we're, we're proud that we were able to help support HMW as they worked through that legal and political process to push those four acts of Congress through. Um, we've been engaging uh, together with HMW, our client, with no less than 10 to 15 jurisdictional entities on the regular. It, it has a political aspect to it, which is very important, and we have to acknowledge that we are beholden to that process because we make it or break it through the success of our partners in the political realm. We've had um, well over, in the last decade, 750 plus community meetings to date. In fact, the Waterfront Park, uh, which I'll hit on a little bit later, was a design community charrette through a series of meetings with all the neighbors to design that. So it's a very important part of this project. A little bit about our client. HMW is Hoffman Madison Waterfront. It's a joint venture between P and Hoffman and Madison Marquette. They have development partners in addition beyond those prime two, uh, including ER Bacon, City Partners, Paramount, and also Trident Development. And so we work with all of these, um, all of these clients. So we have a wide bench and a deep bench, shall we say, of client representation that we work with on a regular basis. So this is the wharf in plan. And I'm going to do some diagrams here to kind of break it down into chunks and make the information a little more palatable as we get our arms around what this project is. So if you look at this, this is from west to east, the full scope of the wharf. And the left half is phase one. The east half is phase two. Uh, when you look at it all combined, some of the stats that are important to note, we're talking about 27 acres of land that have been divided into 11 individual parcels. There are four new public piers that are being constructed and over 49 acres of water that have been activated through the articulation of the wharf's edge. The key vision of this project was that HMW wanted to ensure that it was a highly walkable network. And so when you look at the scale of the city blocks that have been developed here, they're smaller than what you might typically anticipate if you look at the context of the fabric to the north and to the east. And that was accomplished mostly by putting the parking below grade. By putting the parking below grade, they were able to make it more walkable and reduce the size of each city block. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so we're talking about a total of nine buildings, um, four piers, two public parks. Some of the highlights uh, that I'll get into a little bit further on are a 384-seat multi-use uh, cultural venue, 651 residential apartments, 219 condos, 278 hotel rooms that we are building of the total 690 on the site, about 225,000 gross square feet of office space, and retail space throughout at all levels. Retail is a very important driver of the success of this entire model. So all in, we're talking about 1.5 gross, uh, 1.5 million gross square feet of total building area when you look at both the land side and the water side. So phase one is just over 2.0 million square feet. And in cost, it's about 1.2 billion in the design build. So I've highlighted in yellow the zones that are defined as phase one. Phase two is everything else. Phase two is about 1.1 million square feet and approximately 800 million um, to design and build that. So within the yellow zone, I'm going to highlight now the portions of the work that Clark has under contract. Um, so first off, we have parcel two which is a 501 apartment, uh, 501 unit apartment building nestling around the new venue for the 930 Club. Has everyone heard of, everyone familiar with the 930 Club? 
this is where they're going. So there's a steel structure, six stories tall. That's where the 930 Club is come, uh, going. Steel structure, and it's got a big concrete hug. Two towers of residential buildings on either side. Then we have Parcel 3A, which is an office building on the north side of the site. We have Parcel 3B, which is an intercontinental hotel with car properties. Parcel 4 is really two buildings attached together, one of which is apartment, one of which is condo. And then also we have a series of ancillary, we, we call them outbuildings, at some of the knuckles and uh, nexus points of pedestrian access throughout the whole site. So when you take a look at the total uh, construction for the wharf, we have um, in the blue the summary there, that, is, that represents Clark's portion of the total contract. When you take a look at that combined with the maritime construction, combined with all the vertical um, towers, all in the total construction costs uh, are about 70% of the total phase one pro project that HMW has. One of the things to note here is that really there was a land side series of contractors and then there was a maritime series of contractors. And the maritime contractors were contracted directly through our contract, our, our client, HMW. Um, Moffat and Nickel was the maritime engineer working directly for HMW. They had a person full-time working on the project just on shepherding through the design of the maritime uh, engineers. And um, they had two prime maritime contractors, Chimbro and Bellingham, and we worked with them day in, day out in coordinating. And what's interesting about it is sometimes maritime contractors can have the majority of their material flow arrive by water, but not always. And sometimes they had to have their material arrive to the site via land, which meant while we were ripping open this site and you know, going full throttle on beginning the excavation, we had to carve out arteries of pathway so that the maritime contractors could come in from the land side and bring concrete, massive concrete pours out to their waterside interaction. So this was daily coordination. And I've highlighted here on the screen, Chimbro had the, um, the installation of the permanent, we'll call them stationary piers and docks. Bellingham had the installation of the floating docks. Each were equally important in their own right, but we had to provide access from the land side through our site while we had tons of cranes and tons of activity to ensure that we were affording them equal opportunity and access to build their scope of work. So that required, right off the bat, hand-to-hand -hand coordination every single day walking the site. This is a photo that we took from Tower Crane 5 of the seven. This is the one that's almost nearly in the middle of the project. This is looking southwest across the um, transit pier, and you can see here the barge crane that Chimbro has, and they're driving and installing their piles, and they've already started to put in some of their precast structural elements to support the structure of the pier itself. So this was a view shed of how tight and closely we were working together. They were able to bring those precast elements by water, but they were not able to complete their pier until they brought the uh, poured in place concrete through our landside operations to pour on top. So this is a little snippet of the, the juxtaposition and the proximity within which we had to work hand in hand together. So how did this all begin and how did we build this team and how did the partnership between Clark and HMW come to be? It is a long story, but I'm going to reduce it down to a few milestones. Um, so back in 2006, there was an RFP issued by the Anacostia Waterfront Corporation, and HMW, together with 17 of their closest competitors, responded to the RFP, and HMW was the successful winner of the RFP. So they, at that point, had been given authorization to proceed leading the development solution to a revitalized wharf. Um, at the time of the competition, HMW had retained the services of EE and K, which was a firm out of New York City, and EE and K helped them with the submission. They were the visionaries developing the master site plan for the entire wharf. Um, in 2010, EE and K was absorbed and merged into Perkins Eastman out of New York, and so moving forward, you'll hear me talk about Perkins Eastman a lot, but the original group that uh, participated in the competition and generated the master plan really was the EE and K contingent now within Perkins Eastman. So HMW approached Clark and asked us for some pre-construction support. Hey, we'd like some budgets. We might like some schedules. Are you on board? Can you do that? And we said, of course, absolutely. 
it became a full-time commitment uh, for two of our employees. We made the choice that this investment was worth it. We wanted to build as much of the wharf as possible. And so way back in the fourth quarter of 2011, we were so committed to it that we said to HMW, we will give you one of our employees full-time and he will co-locate with you at your beck and call. He will do constructability reviews, he will do budgets, he will do schedules, whatever you ask, we will be there to help think through the mechanics of how to develop this project. Um, so that gentleman's name who did that on behalf of Clark, his name is Tom Cross, and then we added a second person to the mix, his name was Tim Campbell in April of 2012. And so they were co-located um, with the owner on site. So that happened right about here at the end of 2011, and that period of time is represented by that white arrow was two years, full-time co-location, with the client, listening and absorbing what were their concerns, what were some of the financial concerns about how the financing was gonna come to be because it's incredibly complicated and how we were gonna help them respond to that. Uh, we had our groundbreaking in the first quarter of 2014 and we are on track for a substantial completion in October of 2017. Um, sorry, I think I said groundbreaking in 2017. Groundbreaking in 2014 and will be complete in 2017. Um, so, at a certain point in time though, it was about the fall of 2012, this was going design, bid, build, design, bid, build, design, bid, build, and at a certain point, HMW reflected and thought, based on where the markets, the financial markets are gonna be, based on our desire to be going vertical in construction by a certain point in time, we think we need help. Can you take this design build? And of course, when a client asks you if you would like to do a design build, a half a billion dollar design build, there is one answer. The answer is absolutely yes. So we, uh, we said yes, and we were off to the races. So these are the two gentlemen I was talking about on the left, Tom Cross, on the right, Tim Campbell. Uh, Tom Cross has moved on to another company in the industry. Tim Campbell is still with us. We now fondly refer to him as the Oracle um, because any time we need to dredge back into history and understand about how some conversation started, we go consult with the Oracle. And hands down, he always remembers what the history was. So it's really nice to have that continuity of presence. And, and the client, jokingly, they too start to call him the Oracle. They'll come down from the third floor, we're co-located at the channel in, and they'll come down from the third floor and consult with the Oracle about how, how did we talk about this four years ago? What did we initially say we were gonna do? Um, so without Tim and Tom, we would not be here um, building this project today. I wouldn't be here talking to you about it. In March 2013, we memorialized the memorandum of understanding that this is gonna be a design build moving forward, and we we're off to the races. So in the formation of the team, there were many consultants on the owner side but in us taking this on as a design build, we assumed some of the consultants that the HMW team had, and they then became ours. So we inherited through a series of assigned contracts the design team, and then we added and shaped it and rounded it out a little bit further with a few others. So there are many consultants and designers and engineers on this project, but I'm gonna highlight just a few right here. At the very top, the top three logos are the three prime architects on the project. Perkins Eastman, as I mentioned, formerly E and K, they did the master plan concept. Um, they designed parcel two, 3A, horizontal, all the horizontal sitescape, uh, hard surfaces, the parks, the ancillary outbuildings. WDG is the um, construction architect for um, parcel four, which was originally designed by Handel, but WDG is the entity with whom we have a contract right now. And then Cunningham Quill is a very, um, very talented specialty firm that they do very unique boutique types of designs. And so they are the architect on the Capital Yacht Club, which is a jewel box project. I'm gonna show you a few images of it later. Structurally, next tier down, always supporting the architects, right? Structure, supporting the design. So we have SKA, Thornton Tomasetti, and Earl at Bryan. SKA and Thornton Tomasetti are actually in a joint venture together, which was very smart and strategic of them to very early on say, hey, listen, we can fight for pieces of the pie, or we can joint venture and do the whole darn structural solution. And that's what they did. So between SKA and Thornton Tomasetti, there's a pretty clean divide when we look at the um, um, foundation to grade structure and how that communicates up into the towers. SKA primarily has parcel three to the east, and then Thornton Tomasetti has parcel two to the west. Um, so, and then earlier, Brian was the structural engineer on the Capital Yacht Club with Cunningham Quill. Then we have Lab and LAI, um, who were the landscape architects for um, the initial concepts of the parks and then also Waterfront Park. Then Michael Ferguson came on as the landscape architect for the 7th Street Park. And Alan and Sharif is the MEP engineer. They are actually working nest, nested under 
Helix and Arc. Helix and Arc are our captive design build subcontractors that we brought to the table. You know, we bid it out competitively, but these are the partners that we brought to the table. And in order to ensure integrity of the MEP design, we nested Allen and Sharif under both Helix and Arc. So that is essentially the cast of characters that we worked with every day. And that is the team that my Clark series of design managers led through this process for about a year and a half. So this is the org chart of the design team. And when we take a look at that, you can see that we, we, we developed it into silos of which there were some common threads within each. Parcel two, sorry, footing to grade or foundation to grade was this column right here and there was a lot of structural similarities throughout the whole project, but then parcel two mostly had their own cast of characters, 3A and 3B. 3B was design bid build, but there were a lot of similarities in the coordination to make sure that the utilities were supplied correctly for 3B. Parcel four, horizontal, which was all the hardscape, landscape, the site elements, and then also the Capital Yacht Club. And so I had a design manager in charge of each one of those silos, and we had a lot of meetings. There were a lot of meetings. It was chock-a-block. For 18 months, it was seven to five, Monday through Friday, and it, it could have become a very monotonous thing, but we tried to switch it up and keep it lively to keep people focused. Uh, so those are all the companies that we worked with. And when you look at it in totality, it was about 30 consulting firms, well over 150 designers working on the design at any one given time. It's a lot of people to manage. It's a lot of people to motivate. Um, it's a lot of people to keep focused on varying milestones as you work through the project. So here's a sample from September of 2014 of my calendar. This is what a typical week looked like. And what we would do is we tried to set predictable expectations for the team where parcel two was on Tuesdays. Parcel three and parcel four were alternating Wednesdays. Horizontal, footing to grade, all of the parks would be on Thursdays. So the team got into a rhythm and they could anticipate what the weekly milestones were, the bi-monthly milestones were, and the monthly ones as we marched towards 30, 60, 90% CDDs. Because at the time we broke ground in April of 2014, we were only at 100% DDs. We had to bring it from 100% DDs to 100% CDs within essentially 16 months. So we had um, a very busy calendar. And this is where the magic happened. Uh, there was a hotel uh, down at the waterfront called the Channel Inn. Anyone ever heard of the Channel Inn? It was funny because after we broke ground, about four months after, people would still come from Expedia. They thought that they could stay there and they'd roll up to the design office with their suitcases and they're like, can I check in? I'm like, I'm sorry, no, you can't. <laughs> this is not a hotel anymore. We transformed the Channel Inn with HMW into a headquarters, essentially, and HMW is on the third floor, um, or P. N. Hoffman's on the third floor, Madison Marquette's on the second floor, and then Clark is on the first floor. Um, so within this building, there were three existing rooms that were part of the hotel, and we repurposed those. So brace yourselves for this glamorous view of these rooms. Um, the room on the lower left, we called that the captain's room. That's where the majority of the heavy lifting large group meetings happened. We could have 30 people in there up at any given time. It was also the vault. There was no internet access, but for the Wi-Fi account where I would give 10 lucky individuals access if they were delivering their drawings on time. So it was always a fight to see who could turn their drawings in on time because you would get the Wi-Fi access when we had our production meetings. It kept people mo motivated. Um, the upper right-hand corner was the stateroom, and the stateroom is where we would have some of the more formal um, meetings if we had to do a presentation to the owner or we had to you know, work through a new scope of work that we had to develop, we'd reserve that room for that. So a lot of, I know these rooms may look a little drab, because they were, but um, we, we definitely had some great production coming out of these rooms. This is a perspective from that same tower crane I talked about before, Tower Crane 5. Um, looking southeast about midsummer of last year. Um, so w essentially it's a two-story uh, deep um, parking garage. And in order to even begin to think about how we were going to excavate the site, in order to prepare the site, we had to do a few things. One, we had to raise the grade of the site from the water's edge by reconstructing the entire bulkhead along the, the uh, south edge right there. So there was an existing bulkhead, there was an existing sheet pile, but nobody Nobody wanted to take into account the sound structural integrity of that and just take it as the gospel. So essentially, Moffat and Nickel um, started from scratch and said, okay, we need to pretend that we're not relying on this and come up with their own structural system. So 
I'll show you a detail in a section, but we worked very closely with Moffat and Nickel and the maritime contractors to build the new bulkhead, and that involved a series of battered piles, sheet piles, and then a working slab that connected it all. We also had to relocate several thousand feet of water, sewer, electrical, telecommunications lines along Water Street. Water Street, if you look in the distance on the horizon, you can see the old Water Street. That street came all the way through the site, and all those utilities I just mentioned ran all the way through the site. So until we could get those utilities cut, capped, and relocated, the site was cut in half. It was bifurcated. We really could not hit a stride on production until we got all those utilities relocated. So day one, our focus was engaging with the public utility vendors because we needed their help in order to get the utilities relocated because without them, we were totally crippled. So that was a heavy focus in the first six to nine months. So two, two stories of underground parking, about 700,000 square feet, 1,492 vehicle spaces, and just over 1,000 bike spaces, speaking to the walkable, bikeable community uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, in this diagram here, this is the final as-built of all the piles. We had a total of 5,736, sorry, 763 piles that we drove. And so this is the final as-built of it. And I've, I've done a little gestural diagram of where the WMATA yellow line runs underneath the site, because we also have a WMATA tunnel running under the site to add that complexity. Um, on the west side, there were eight zones of uh, pile driving that we divided into approximately 2,700 piles. On the east side, we had five zones. Um, fewer zones, but more piles, because that makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, all in all, it's, it was a pretty massive hole. Uh, it's a pretty massive development. But when you think about the total cubic yards of soil removed, we were talking about 300,000 cubic yards, 33,333 trucks. I mean, it was, it was a sensitive item for DDOT. We had to work very carefully with them on our truck routing plans and making sure that we were respectful of the adjacent residential communities and that we weren't starting before 7 o'clock and we had to pull as much dirt out of the hole within our allotted time each day. So one of the interesting things that um, is the hidden benefit of the way we've baked the sustainability into every layer of the design is that one of the most sustainable aspects of the project is actually happening right below your feet. So this wharf, you know, is essentially, when we refer, it to, refer to it as the wharf, we're talking about essentially the waterfront edge. Some people may call it a, board, a boardwalk. That is very taboo. We do not call it a boardwalk. It is the wharf um, with very beautiful porphyry pavers. And right underneath the porphyry pavers and at this edge right here, the water's edge, you can see the boats. This is essentially the wharf right here, various different patterns of the porphyry pavers. Underneath, you start the edge of the parking garage. Within the parking garage, there are two monumental gray water cisterns, totaling about 800,000 gallons. And basically, that system is reclaiming all of the stormwater that is not being absorbed by the trees on the site or the green roofs. And that is a pretty remarkable quantity of water to be processing. And all that is happening right below your feet as you're walking along the wharf's edge. So while this technically isn't part of the Anacostia watershed, um, the responsibility is a very important thing to make sure that we're good stewards of the environment. And that was one of the day one concepts for HMW. Um, from a neighborhood perspective, it's going for lead gold and then on the vertical towers, um, lead silver for those towers. Okay. So, this is a series of renderings that are going to kind of show some of the details of the project itself. This is if you were a giant standing on Banneker Overlook, looking southeast across the project, it's an aerial view. There is this canyon divided between uh, the two towers of Parcel 2, and that shape was driven primarily by the viewshed that uh, everyone wanted to preserve, looking from Banneker Overlook out towards the water, and so they divided the canyon through the two uh, towers of concrete of apartments that nestle around the 930 Club. As you can see, it's a very active rooftop there. Uh, parcel 3A to the north right here, office building. Um, and then parcel um, 4 coincidentally has a roof shape in the shape of a 4. So it makes it very easy to find parcel 4. 
at all times. You can see it right there, the gray um, prow of the pop-ups of the condos. It's a four, very easy to orient yourself in space. We did not design it that way, it just happened to be that way. Um, parcel five on the other end, we have, um, we are not constructing it, but it is a hybrid uh, model, a very unique model that's apparently very hot in Europe right now and also Canada. Uh, which is the combination of a Hyatt House and a Hilton Canopy. Um, so all of these types of new models are being tested out here at the wharf. So a closer look at Parcel 2. It was designed by Perkins Eastman, and this is the Thornton Tomasetti half of the structural team. Lead Silver, 6,000 person concert hall, home of the new 930 Club. Two 12-story residential towers combined about 450,000 square feet. Um, and of the 501 apartments, it's notable that 30% of them are affordable and workforce housing. And that was part of the partnership that HMW had with the district to make sure that that was a significant percentage of the housing. Um, fun facts, there's a glass bottom swimming pool uh, right over the entrance to the 930 Club. So as you walk in for your concert, you can look up and you can see people swimming above you, which is, <laughs> was fun to design structurally. Um, the, uh, the Wharf Hall, because this makes a lot of sense, putting a wharf hall, rock concert hall with low frequency vibration music amidst residential towers. So how do you do that? You essentially structurally isolate it as if it's a seismic event, which is what we did. So when you look at the interface between the steel structure and the concrete, we employed a lot of seismic uh, tools to make sure that the concert hall is shaking at its own low frequency vibration while that is not exposed to the residential units on either side. That was also an interesting conundrum. Um, so this is an animation courtesy of HMW Marketing, but this shows from the water's perspective um, how the entrance on the south elevation of Parcel 2, this is the main entrance for Wharf Hall right here. Um, the beginning of that animation, you saw the bulkhead treatment. Th that precedent was pulled from a very famous waterfront in Rotterdam. And uh, so they, they went all around the world to source it, sources of inf inspiration there. So Wharf Hall, this is a preview of what Wharf Hall is going to look like. It can be used for industry conferences. It can be used for weddings. It can be used for rock concerts, this is the original purpose, but it's a multi-purpose venue and uh, a flat floor which enables it to host the flexibility and a variety of different events. And so we're very excited about that first concert which will be occurring in October of 2017. Parcel 3A was designed by Perkins Eastman and SKA. 12 stories, 220,000 square feet of Class A office building. This one will be lead gold. And what's interesting about this one is that this structure is poured directly over the Wamata Igra shaft. The Wamata Igra shaft, you may recall the fatal event in January of 2015. We were at the project and out popped from the Igra shaft three people that had escaped that event. Three people came out in the middle of our job site. So that is the importance of keeping that shaft open and operational and that has been one of our primary charges from a safety perspective from day one. Not to mention we have to build a, build a building over and around that shaft while we keep it open and operational. So that was, a, that was a very present reminder of the importance of keeping that shaft clear, free, and fully accessible to emergency personnel. Um, so in July of 2015, HMW announced the first office tenant uh, here. They're very excited. Muriel Bowser was there. It was actually at our uh, bottoming out party. Um, the American Psychiatric Association, APA, they're taking 63,000 of the 220,000 square feet. And just behind it, you can see the other um, parcel 3B, which is the Intercontinental Hotel, 278 keys, which we are building for car properties. This is a view shed looking down between parcel 2, it's looking south, between parcel 2 and 3A. And this talks a little bit about, just says, a little bit about the type of um, pedestrian experience that uh, we have worked into the design here. Uh, very activated with water all along the spine leading out to the pier. This is the Capital Yacht Club jewel box I was talking about the Cunningham Quill uh, specialized in. And so their structural engineers, El Elbert Bryan. Uh, it's a two-story building housing the Capital Yacht Club. So it's essentially for private use. Um, it has a butterfly roof, stone cloud facade, decorative metal panels, wood lo louvers over the windows, and it's built atop a pier in the channel, which is servicing about 98 slips for the Capital Yacht Club. It has a meeting space, a bar lounge for the members, uh, shower facilities for those that may not already have a shower on their boat. 
This is parcel four, originally designed by Handel out of New York, and WDG is our um, construction architect together with SKA Structural. This will be lead silver. It's two 12-story towers, one to the north, one to the south, bifurcated by a road that runs, or a, it's really a pedestrian walkway that bifurcates it running in an east-west direction. 370,000 square feet total, 112 condos, and 150 apartments. One of the things that we're very focused on uh, is the quality control going all the way from the initial concept through to the articulation of the building envelope. And so we have on the site, just across from the Channel Inn, three different mock-ups for parcels 2, 3A, and 4. And these are mock-ups that we constructed of the most difficult details to make sure that as a team, the field side and the office side fully understood all the ins and outs of the potentials for leaks and how we could make sure that the design, which theoretically is always ironclad, truly is ironclad so that when you test it and you make sure that it's not going to leak, you can give the owner the confidence that you're building a sound building. So this is parcel two on the left, uh, parcel 3A right there in the middle, and then parcel four on the right. This is a view of Pearl Street, that uh, pedestrian uh, breezeway that I mentioned that uh, runs through and underneath parcel four. This is a view of what the retail experience is going to feel like. Um, for the project. So that's looking to the west through that pedestrian area there. And you can see the prev um, prevalence of the porphyry pavers there. The retail theme is very focused on the music and the entertainment experience. That was a big part of the financial model that HMW crafted to make sure that one of the generating seeds of if you build it, they will come was the cultural entertainment restaurant uh, component of their mix. So this was a huge part of their vision of how they were going to draw people down to the waterfront. Um, this is a view of the wharf looking east towards parcel four. You can see the prow of parcel four jutting out right about here. This is parcel 3B, uh, the Intercontinental Hotel. Um, but again, you get a sense of the size and scale, and as I mentioned before, the water collection system is directly under there. You can actually see the trench drain that runs along the east-west, but that is a big part of the sustainable solution for this project. Um, and one of the things that's really um, interesting is the fact that so many micro units are present in this spread of um, the mix of the unit types. Some of the micro units that we have in parcel two are 350 square feet with Murphy beds, quite lean, the concept being that you could move in with a suitcase, um, highly designed and highly amenitized. 2010 census was showing that 82% of the households were without children and half are single people living alone. So parcel two, uh, 501, 501 apartments, is very geared towards that industrial hipster, um, nomadic, shall we say, lifestyle. Um, so that was part of the, the solution there in the mix of units. When you take a look at parcels two and four, this is parcel two specifically, um, I mentioned earlier that 30% of the units are affordable and workforce housing distribution. And so that was a very important part. Here it's highlighted which units those are. Uh, we've worked very carefully with HMW and with our subcontractors during the design and the bidding process to make sure that we were putting in all of the appropriate enabling uh, requirements as well for ADA. So with our parks, there are two prime parks that we're building under phase one. One of them is Waterfront Park all the way on the southeastern edge. The other is the 7th Street Park, which bounds the eastern edge of Parcel 5. Um, Waterfront Park was a collaboration with the community. Um, there were people that had a particular fondness for certain trees in these community meetings and said, I need this tree to be saved. And so we saved that tree and we relocated it as part of our design. Um, and then 7th Street Park is a kind of very linear park that runs from uh, Water or Main Street down to the pier, the uh, 7th Street Pier there. So conundrums with constructive solutions. I'm going to um, show you some technically challenging ones and then also some lighthearted ones because you have to mix a little bit of the lightheartedness with the intensity. So the bulkhead, we talked about a little bit how we interface with the maritime contractors. And the bulkhead truly was where the water met the land in all ways, shapes, and form. This was a image from June of 2015. This is right around, uh, this is about the eastern edge of parcel 3B. Looking south across the water, that is the uh, uh, pier that the Capital Yacht Club is being built on. That building goes right on that, right there. 
Um, and it's an excellent perspective of the fact that when we were at the bottom of the hole, we were well below the waterline. That is a humbling thing. And you just thank the technical competence of your structural engineers when you are standing in a hole that is that far below the water's edge. And you look up and you think that the water line is that much higher than you. Um, so it, it brings an appreciation of the intensity of the structure there. So we had a series of rakers. We had a series of driven and battered piles. And you can see the new sheet pile that we drove there. There's a um, working slab behind on the precast on top. This is actually a section of it here. You can see the original, original bulkhead right here, sheet pile, with the original bulkhead on top. We um, worked together with HMW with our two sets of contractors to install the driven pile, the battered pile, the new sheet pile line, and then the working slab on top and the precast, which is the substrate to which that fancy um, marine waterfront bulkhead, the timbers, are attached. That required many, many meetings between three different sets of structural engineers. And um, it was a very tough nut to crack, but uh, over the course of two years, it was done quite successfully, I would say. Another would be in parcel two. I mentioned it earlier, putting a rock concert hall in the middle of a residential building, not necessarily intuitive. So we had to make sure that we had a very careful treatment of the acoustic isolation of this work. And so uh, we actually retained not one, but two acoustic consultants, Cerami and Acoustics. Cerami was focused on the preservation of the residential acoustic experience and making sure that contaminants from the concert hall didn't come into the residential units. Acoustics focused on the integrity of the sound quality within the conference, uh, within, within the concert hall. Um, and so when you have two different focused acoustic consultants and we have to find a way to make them come up with a wall construction assembly that serves both needs, you have a lot of interesting conversations and you learn a lot about uh, mass and air and what it does for sound. So i um, happy to say that we came to a solution that worked on every floor. Here's a diagram from one of the floors that the first residential floor actually a parcel two. You can see the rings of the residential rounding to the northeast and the southwest. Those are the two towers of residential units where bedroom walls and bathroom walls are literally right up against the edge of the concert hall. And this red line here denotes the special treatment that we had to put in place acoustically to accomplish what these two consultants were having us do. Um, with regards to the tower crane and the access of concrete to the site, we have seven tower cranes on site. Um, two specific choices that we made in the management of the concrete flow to the site that were important. Number one, just like the Toyota way, you, you never really want to have one single source of a supply for any particular widget. In our case with concrete, we had a very um, beginning conversation between Clark Concrete and Miller and Long to make sure that in answering the question of how to get 3,000 cubic yards of concrete to the site in any given week, um, which is at nine yards a truck, about 333 trucks per week, it was a logistical nightmare. How are we going to do that? So very earlier on, we made sure that we were having conversations between Clark Concrete and Miller and Long on that. Um, I think it's a testament to the collegial relationship that we have with Miller and Long there that we could prepare ourselves in the market for what was about to hit. And then secondarily, um, you know, the days of preparing for pours and pouring concrete at the wharf are long. They're 12 to 13 hour days. It is uh, just in time preparation for that pour. And traditionally, you like to be pouring concrete between 6 and 2 or 7 and 3 in the DC market, like everybody else. Well, we decided we were going to hit the sweet spot between about 3 to 7. And the level of service that we got between 3 and 7, right before rush hour truly hit, we had a higher level of service in those four hours than we would have had in the eight hours earlier on during the day. So that was a conscious choice, and it worked out well for us. And instead of receiving about 60 cubic yards per hour, we were receiving about 100 cubic yards per hour. This is a view shed of the juxtaposition between the concert hall for uh, 930 Club with some of the structural concrete shear walls on uh, parcel two. And this is one of our Clark uh, concrete workers there. Birds of prey. So um, we, being on the Washington Channel, have a lot of air traffic. It informed the STC rating of the glass treatment on many of our buildings. And the one that makes everybody stop and pause is when the Osprey flies by. It's just a patriotic moment. You feel proud um, when you see that drive by. And so that was one aspect of a bird of prey. But we also had another bird of prey. Um, we became the fan favorites of uh, an, a pair of ospreys. And every day, they would rebuild their nest to the beginning or at the top of the boom of one of our cranes. And every day, we'd take the sticks out. And we were all in like egg watch. Because once they lay the eggs, it's over. So instead of trying to duke it out with this tenacious pair of birds, we thought, you know what? Let's embrace this. Let's improvise and adjust. Let's build them a nest. 
So we went on the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, got the specs, built them a nest, and we placed it front and center, right by the hole. We took an extra pile, and we built a nest, and we called them Popeye and Olive Oil, and they had their family, and then they flew off. So that was, uh, that was a special moment with the birds. Picture of them right there. Um, team building, we make sure that when we are doing our philanthropic efforts that we're aligning with the interests of the project, what it's trying to achieve. And so for Earth Day 2015 and 16, we partnered with the Anacostia Watershed Society and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation to clean up the Anacostia watershed. That was a very important thing to make sure that we were giving back in the way that we've been given the benefit of having the opportunity to work in this area. And then we're making progress every day. This is an image from March of 2016. Uh, the owner has a drone take pictures every month, and this is one of the images that was captured by them. This is looking southeast across the entire site. You can see our, well, you can kind of see that we have seven tower cranes there, but they do. It's very busy, so it's hard to read it. This is looking from the north, south. Um, you can see where we're starting to go. Um, who's coming out of the ground first? Parcel four is coming out of the ground first. So that's five, four, three A, three B, two, and then one on the far right. Um, so as of this week, parcel two, we're executing our fourth out of 14 steel sequences. And um, parcel four, we're in the middle of our second pour on level six. So it, it is really moving. The pace of the job is flying right now. Um, if you count the shadows in this image, you can see that there are seven tower cranes. We have about 700 people on site today. By the end of quarter four of this year, we anticipate we'll peak at about 1350. Um, so we have a lot of people on site to manage and very much appreciate the time that I've had to be here today to share with you my experience on the wharf. Thank you very much for your time. And I think I'll open up questions. Yes, sir. Since you decided, to, or the owner decided to go to Dying Bill yeah. as the project delivery, how are they contracting with you? Is it by phase or, or GMPs? I mean, it's a massive contracting process, I'm sure. That, uh, can you just give us a little brief on how that's handled? Sure. Uh, we have a GMP contract. We have a series of GMP contracts with the owner, and it's broken down into um, they have, they have 27, I believe it's 27 different REITs on the project, so a lot of it had to do with how the financing was coming in and the way it was all paired together. Um, but we have essentially um, three different, the original condition was that we had three different GMP contracts with them. And then um, when 3B, the Intercontinental Inter, um, Continental Hotel, came on board, um, that ended up being um, a contract that we did directly with CAR. So that one was design bid build, but we're building it actively and we're delivering it on the same schedule as everything else. Lots of contracts and lots of recs. The rec is about that thick. Yes? I would say, um, and, and I think this goes for any project any size scale, um, and this was something that um, I spent a lot of time uh, focusing on teaching my team on how to manage it, but when you have a team of 30 people that are in a meeting trying to advance a concept, it is very easy for there to be tacit dissension. That happens a lot. So I, I would say, and, and I picked up on this within the first two to four weeks of the project, that tacit dissension within you know, say a very specialized engineer sulking on how the direction of a certain design solution is going. And the, the role of the design manager and the design executive is to scan, observe, and pick up on the subtle cues and call it out. Not in a accosting kind of way, but make sure that everybody's voice is heard. Some people may not have the confidence to bring the best solution that's in their head to the table. And so it's the job of the person who's brokering and ushering through that process of the design build to be an excellent listener, to observe, and look out for that. Because in the moments where I've nipped what I'll call tacit dissension, that was the catalyst for some of our best solutions. And, and so that was the thing that my team and I talked a lot about, which is how do you read the subtle cues of all your team members? Because sometimes the best solution is not the one that everyone thinks is the right one that you're all talking about and getting all excited about. You have to watch the, the peanut gallery because the peanut gallery may actually be informing that in a way that improves your decision. 
Any others? Yes? So, so I think I'm hearing maybe three questions within your question. The first one is about how did we design, how did we design together with the owner what the long-term operating and maintenance aspect of that was. They had retained during the initial development, um, during the design development phase, consultants who were helped shaping how we were going to pick the mechanical and electrical systems that were best suited for long-term services. We've done a lot of brown bag lunch and learn with the owner on when we were pulling what type of you name it, uh, building management system or elevator system, we'd weigh the pros and cons of the long-term 5, 10, 15 year maintenance and management and we'd make a decision together with the owner about not only what worked best for the budget but what worked best for the long-term solution. So that was very, uh, that was very present in the forefront of our mind when we were thinking about that. Um, I think the second part of your question, maybe it's only two questions within the question, is how do you maintain this beautiful vista when there's the, the price and the cost of progress, which is construction, right? All my neighbors always complain about these roads are atrocious, you know, they're under renovation. I'm like, yeah, but that's the cost of progress, right? I mean, we're improving our quality of life by renovating and building better cities and places to be. Um, so yes, it's a mega project and phase one has, um, definitely been a presence in the traffic impact, shall we say, um, but we have done the absolute, I think, very best proactive um, tra uh, traffic control plan that we've done, uh, that we've developed and worked very closely in collaboration with DDOT, and um, I, I, I see it as an investment in the future. And yes, there is a momentary um, inconvenience by that, but I think it really is part of the investment. I mean, when you look at the final solution of what the design offers with regards to the bike lanes and the walkability and the connection to the modes of public transportation, it's quite remarkable how this is going to become a new epicenter on the southwest waterfront. Time for maybe one more question? Sorry, there's two. In the back? Yes, sir? Yes, sir. You're asking what is it? We track a lot of metrics around safety. Um, so we have safety orientations every day for um, new construction workers that are coming on site. Um, actually, last week was Clark's National Safety Week, um, where we have a series of um, initiatives that we make sure that we're conducting to practice our emergency preparedness. We conducted uh, emergency drills on every single Clark construction project in the country on Wednesday morning of last week. Um, so we made sure that we communicated that to the workers and the neighbors so that without telling them how to specifically react, we knew that on this day there's going to be a drill and here's where our rally points are. Um, we track, with regards to metrics, we track everything. We track near misses, we track first aids, we track recordables, we track lost times and we take all of them very seriously. I personally treat near misses as seriously as I do lost times. Um, and, you know, in, in my mind, if I can just kind of sum it up for you at Clark, um, safety is a core value. It's not a priority. Priorities can shift as things and circumstances happen throughout the day. Your priorities shift, right? So we can't afford for safety to be a priority because then there's a the risk of it not being the number one priority. For us, it's a core value. Um, and that informs every aspect of how we plan the work. We had many conversations about the safe installation and erection of the steel sequences back when we were starting our very first 30% CDs conversation on the steel in parcel two. We brought the steel subs in to talk about what is the smartest way to design the steel, not just so it looks cool and functionally it works structurally, what's the safest way to actually erect it so that we can make sure that we're building it safely with the teams. We, we, we led those meetings with the subcontractor community. Did I answer your question? Was that a thumbs up? Okay, great. There was one other question over here. I just had a question about how the um, existing retailers fit into the aesthetic of your new design. 
meaning like captains yep. and Jesses. Yep. So um, I don't actually have an image of it here, but on the very northwest side of the entire development, um, one of the structures is actually going through a, a historic preservation. Um, there is going to be a rum distillery that is added down there, and that, if you look at the scale and the size of the structures within that area there, it gets down to the one to two story level. So we have 12 stories mostly across the, the projects that I just described, but on the far west side of parcel one, the scale drops down to be like an open air market where there's going to be a farmer's market on Saturdays and there's gonna be the rum distillery and there's gonna be Jesse's and Captain White. So that scale drops down to preserve the integrity and um, the uniqueness of that historic mm -hmm. aspect there. Any more? Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.